my stroke was without question a blessing and I am absolutely so lucky to have had it. Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 65 of the Stroke Cast. When I had my stroke back in June of 2017, I was already a big fan of the podcast medium. I already had another show at that point. Uh, Two Minute Talk Tips was up around episode 23 that back then. So as I began my journey to learn all about neurology by looking for stroke-related podcasts, I was a little disappointed. I found only a couple of shows at first, the Enable Me show from Australia and the Slow Road to Better from Vienna, Virginia. And of course, I was thrilled uh, later on to have the folks from the Slow Road to Better uh, join us here on StrokeCast. Eventually, though, I, I did find a couple of more shows, and you can see a list of a variety of stroke-related podcasts over at strokecast.com slash other podcasts. The lack of shows at that point, though, led me to start StrokeCast to be the resource I wished I had had six months earlier. It turns out that Joe Borges was thinking something very similar at right about the same time. A couple of weeks after StrokeCast started, Joe and his co-host Lauren launched NeuroNerds, a podcast by a stroke survivor and a TBI survivor, sharing their journey, the journeys of their brain buddies, and celebrating all things nerdy, stroke-related or not. I originally found the NeuroNerds through the Stromies, a group of stroke survivors in Nebraska who are three awesome women who appeared on this show in December over at strokecast.com slash stromies. See, everything is eventually all tying together in this community. And as part of that process, I became a fan of Joe and Lauren. Joe Borges has worn various hats from retail store owner to artist manager to business consultant, but after suffering a major hemorrhagic stroke in August of 2016, He's been on a journey of self-discovery and seeking out what truly gives him joy in life. He's on a mission to create a life worthy of the gift he was given when he survived his stroke. One more important note before we start the conversation here. I kind of screwed up the name of the new Star Wars movie. It's The Rise of Skywalker, not The Last Skywalker, like I said in the interview. And I hang my head in nerd shame. Can I just blame stroke-related neurofatigue for that? Anyway, let's meet Joe. So, Joe, thank you so much for joining us here on StrokeCast this week. Oh, man, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. I mean, I've been listening to you for months on the NeuroNerds podcast, as, as we heard about in the intro, and, you know, it's great to finally actually talk. Oh, this is great. I always love talking and connecting with other survivors. Like, it, it's such a big help to myself, and I think it helps others as well. Yeah, it definitely does. I mean, uh, the social isolation that a lot of survivors deal with and feel is such a huge problem uh, for folks. It's why shows like uh, lo- like the podcasts are important. It's why uh, the support groups in person and online are also important. Uh, for helping to to make those connections. Yeah, I could not agree more. So, um, so let's get started with you know what was your life like before your stroke? Um, it was it was a lot of str- <laughs> it was a lot of stress. It was a lot of um, so going to therapy now post stroke. Like I found out a lot about like myself pre stroke. So I've been basically kind of in survival mode since I was around seven years old. Um, which, you know, it's didn't leave a lot of time to like process feelings and talk things through. It's just trying to get through your day. So that built up a lot of stress. I grew up, um, poor, so I never really went to doctors. (laughs) Um, so as an adult, I just had that thing. Either I dealt with it or I got so sick that I just went to the emergency room because I didn't have insurance. 
Um, and I just carried a lot of stress. I'm also a recovering Catholic, so I was taught never to process anything. <laughs> I was taught just to shove it down. Don't talk about it. Don't inconvenience anybody with your issues. Just deal with it. So I did that for the better part of my entire life until, you know, my brain exploded and now I'm here. <laughs> Right. You know, I think that's really interesting. And then, you know, when you live your life and, you know, under that sort of constant stress and under those, the, those sort of constant restrictions, you end up, you know, just running your adrenaline at just full peak production the whole time, which sort of screws up the way the rest of the brain perceives things. A absolutely. Like your body, you're not supposed to be tense 24 hours a day. Like f you, I felt kind of like a squirrel, like real fidgety and really agitated really quickly. Like I was always on edge, like something was going to come get me. I don't know why. It was just kind of how I was raised. So being that way, it didn't leave a lot of time to look forward to things like I didn't really know what travel was because I couldn't look that far ahead. I was just trying to get through the next 24 hours. And if I did that, I won. That was like a success. You know, that's mm -hmm. not really living, though. I survived. So that's how I describe pre stroke pre stroke. I survived. That reminds me of one of the things that, you know, Star Trek's Chekhov, Walter Koenig, said a lot in his uh, his memoir is that. Uh, most of his perspective and most of his life, he's been waiting for the other shoe to drop, waiting for everything to just collapse in the next moment. Oh, he just described my upbringing. <laughs> <laughs> it's such it's an unfortunate way to live because life is such a beautiful thing. And it's I try not to look back at it and see it as wasted time. I just look back and, and say, oh, wow, that's something I never, ever want to do again. Right, right. But it's the path that got you to where you are today. Absolutely. I, you know how they say, like, I wouldn't change anything. I might, but <laughs> I am here and I'm happier than I've ever been. So it's kind of working out the way it's supposed to. So, so what happened that day that you had the stroke? <laughs> well, <clears throat> so I suffered from migraines most of my adult life. I was under the, again, I didn't go to doctors. So I was just under the assumption that, oh, well, migraines were in my family. It's my turn. And when I say mm. migraines, I mean debilitating 12 hour, I'm throwing up in the shower migraines. Mm. Um, so it was just one of those days where I just had this just vicious migraine. My girlfriend, who is a singer songwriter, she had a show. So I was on um, the way to her show and it just, it, I had the worst headache. It was the, the one of the worst headaches I've ever had. And I had incredible headaches, like my entire adult life. And it was, this one was just a little bit different. It was so painful. And I remember walking to where she was performing and her father was in town. Thank goodness, actually. So so we're walking there and, and I'm just complaining like I don't feel well. And a, for a split second, I felt relief. There was a little bit of a pop. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I was like, oh, uh, like the headache went away for a split second. And then right. That was the moment the vessel burst in my brain. I had a hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, so the right basal ganglia had just burst in my brain and it felt it, like sweet relief for about two seconds. And then after that, every muscle fiber in my body turned to jelly. It mm. just, it was really strange. I don't remember much because, uh, you know, my brain was flooding with blood. So <laughs> right. uh, it, it killed a certain amount of brain cells. So I have so, some memory issues. Um, but from everything that I was told, I, one of the things I said was, wow, it feels like I'm learning how to walk again. Because that's what it was. And also me, I, I'm being from New York. You you understand this. I'm a very stubborn person. So I didn't want to not see the show because I love seeing my girlfriend perform. Um, I love hearing her sing. I didn't want to be an inconvenience because, again, there's a recovering Catholic coming out. And I want to inconvenience anybody. So I just dealt with it. Uh, I remember um, I had a beer. <laughs> so that was probably not, not a good idea, but I did. <laughs> Um, and then I don't remember anything for at least uh, just over a month after that. I have bits and pieces, like little flashes, like the movie Memento, but I don't sure. really have much memory. I know that my, the next morning I refused to go to the hospital and I was throwing up and they just thought I had food poisoning and they called the doctor and the doctor said like it seemed like I might have um, uh, uh, I was dehydrated. So they knew it was an issue when the next morning I woke up and my girlfriend had a lesson to give. She teaches vocal lessons mm -hmm. uh, um, to, to a client. And she was uh, she said, hey, hey, I need the room. You know, go lay down on the couch. And when she came out, I was standing in the kitchen and she's like, hey, I thought I told you to go to the living room, lay on the couch. And in a really nasty voice, I said, I am in the living room. 
Huh. She was like, she was like, oh, oh, okay. So she called up uh, her uncle, and her uncle had a brain tumor a few years ago, and he was like, that's absolutely, that's neurological, that's a problem. Get him to the hospital immediately. Right. And thank goodness her dad was there, and they both forced me to go because I'm a very stubborn human being, <laughs> and I probably would still just be fighting it today. Actually, I probably I wouldn't be here today. I'm sure. Right. So, and then right. when I got to the hospital, they let them know that um, I had a high blood pressure induced hemorrhagic stroke. Wow. You know, and that that's one of those one of those magic phrases in the ER is I'm having the worst headache of my entire life. That <laughs> that's one of those phrases that will get you past the triage list immediately in for a neuro workup. Right, right. Yeah, and, and it it was bad because like I had dealt with them like forever. Like I I can't remember mm-hmm. a time in my adult life that I didn't have migraines. It just got worse and worse and worse as the years went on. Uh, basically, it was my body saying, hey, hey, dummy, if you don't do anything <laughs> different, you're going to die. <laughs> so but this one in particular, it was it was bad. It was it was just severe, you know, and and thank thank goodness, you know, I, I was there and I have my, my, my beautiful girlfriend to take care of me and her dad to like, you know, make sure that I didn't do anything stupid, like just try to stay home. Right. Right. Exactly. You know, that's one of those things, too, where, you know, high blood pressure until it's actively immediately causing a problem, it, it's insidious because it doesn't hurt at all. Right. Yes. <laughs> right. It's so strange. So it, it was a combination of things. It was a lot of stress. It was a stagnant lifestyle. I was um, a, a lot more depressed than I think I thought I was. I was very anxious. Um, I was just kind of stuck and it was things just kept piling on and it was a combination of all of those things. I didn't just didn't really take care of myself Mm -hmm. again. Just being in survival mode, me getting to the next day was a win. You know, it didn't matter how I got there. I just got there. Um, I I ate terribly. I thought terribly. So all of that led into the high blood pressure, the unchecked high blood pressure, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, when you started to have, uh, uh, start, started to remember things from your hospital experience and your inpatient experience. Then, what was your what was your experience like in rehab? Well, re- so it was strange. It was very strange because not remembering exactly what happened and how I got there was weird. It's just kind of like one day I woke up and somebody's helping me, you know, walk, helping me sit up. Um, you know, to helping me to the shower because like I couldn't really function. I was in bed. Like the whole situation was very strange because it, it, I had no control. Like one minute, um, it's my normal every day to day. The next minute, I'm surrounded by all of these strange people telling me what to do, how to do it, and I can't function the way that I normally function. So, and also, I was a different person physically um being in bed uh for that long all my muscles i guess atrophied and i couldn't really you know i had no strength i lost somewhere around 30 pounds wow because you know i i wasn't i guess eating i wasn't really moving it, i was i was kind of deteriorating mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so rehab w- was interesting because it was starting over it was literally starting fresh because I fancy myself a pretty good athlete, you know, play a little college basketball, like I'm, I'm a, a pretty decent athlete. And now I can't even stand up on my own. You know, it was a shock to my system. So um, experience was, in a word, insane. <laughs> that, that's that's kind of how, how I felt. It, it was, but radical acceptance. I was there and I was like, all right, let's do this. Let's figure it out. You know, and I just uh, um, uh, kept pushing through no matter how strange and crazy it was. Yeah, and that's the thing. It is it is so such a such a strange experience because you know, at one level you know how to walk, you know intellectually how to walk, but your brain has completely forgotten the information about how to translate that into instructions into those particular muscles. Oh yeah, your your the brain is fascinating. You know, it's it's an absolute computer. You know, and my computer unfortunately fell. <laughs> it was dropped several times, so it, it's just figuring out um um everything again. You know, I, I it could have been much worse for me. Like physically, I'm 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 doing pretty good. You know, like I, I I've 
don't have as as deep a deficits as a, a lot of others and i feel like i'm a miracle for it you know the mm. fact that i had a hemorrhagic stroke that's a very low percentage of people that survive that and right. the fact that i survived it it's a it, even lower percentage of people that are as functional as i am you know i feel like i'm kind of killing it mm-hmm. and it's it's there's a reason i don't know what that is but there, there's a reason so th- that's always a reason for me to keep pushing forward no matter what you know i'm here for something Absolutely. Absolutely. And you're certainly doing doing the work with that today with your various initiatives. What you know, when you say you're lucky, one of the things I I always find really interesting is that so many of the survivors that I talk to uh, or that I hear from, you know, say that same thing. They feel so lucky that it went the way that it did and that it didn't go a different direction. And it's you know, it's surprising to hear hear that as as such a common refrain Uh, and i feel that way too about my own it is strange isn't it because i i remember vividly my girlfriend sweetest most beautiful person in the world she said after my stroke this is one of the 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 first memories one of the memories that like i held on to i I held on to maybe five to ten percent of anything that happened the first couple of months but that this is one of the things where she said this was a blessing And Mm. I remember I I couldn't really I had I had a cane to walk. I I was I was panicky. I was frail. I was deteriorating. And and I was like, I don't think you know what blessing is. (laughs) (laughs) But it took me some time to get back to to life, you know, to back to actually living, not just surviving for actually living to where I understood 100 percent what she meant. It was a blessing. I was killing mm-hmm. myself slowly. I wasn't living. You know, I what what was happening before my stroke wasn't living. It was barely surviving. And I was killing myself slowly. That was without this, I would still be doing the same things. I, I would just be going going through life like a zombie. You know, mm-hmm. it was terrible. My stroke was without question a blessing. And I am absolutely so lucky to have had it. That's, uh, that is a fantastic perspective to have. And, you know, and today you've been able to do so many so many things with it. And you mentioned you st- you're still contending with some memory issues. Are there other deficits you're you're uh, living through today so my main um, issue was memory I had a, a lot of short-term memory issues I still have some the long-term stuff is all all there there's a couple of times there's a couple things where I'm like man I should know who this person is but I don't <laughs> um, and sometimes I'll I'll do some weird things you know like uh, uh, put something somewhere that I normally wouldn't just weird brain things that I know or I'll forget something mm-hmm. now I know the difference it's hard to explain to people who don't really know like I know the difference in me being forgetful and me having a strokey moment you know <laughs> and I have a lot more of those strokey moments than I, I, I like but it's it's not as bad as as some other people you know so again mm-hmm. perspectives everything I also suffer from a little bit of tremors in my right hand um, which you know, I'm, I was very sloppy to begin with, so it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> but um, I'm working that out through with my occupational therapist, who has been just hands down such an important, like such an amazing part of my recovery. And she's actually helping me with my 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 memory, with my um, tremors. Uh, so those have um, uh, I wouldn't say they're they're gone. I still have issues, but it's night and day what it used to be. Same thing with the memory. Still some short term memory stuff, but night and day where um, from where I was. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and, and you're right about that, you know, that, that sort of difference between a strokey moment versus, you know, forgetfulness. And, you know, it's something you don't even think about, but it, it really is so qualitatively different. In my case, uh, a lot of that comes down to there's one thing uh, about being tired. And then there's another thing when that neuro fatigue hits. And it's oh, so fundamentally different. <laughs> It's so different. And can, can I tell you, anybody out there that's listening that is not a stroke survivor, understand when you say you're tired, oh, well, I get tired too. It no. is not the same. <laughs> understand when you say, oh, well, I forget things too. It is not the same thing. You're not making us feel better. You're not making me feel better. You're actually making me feel worse, you know? Um, exactly. So, yeah, so it, it, you can sympathize, but, you know, just probably don't compare <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly and i know it comes from a place of people meaning well but um you know it's one of those things if uh, if you you don't have uh disabilities or uh or, or conditions like that i i would definitely recommend checking out 
the Twitter hashtag disabled snark or the Twitter hashtag abled's are weird. Because <laughs> I love that. I'm absolutely going to do that. Yeah. I mean, there's so much com- – there's some fantastic commentary in there from people with disabilities talking about their experiences. And some of it is funny and some of it is horrifying and some of it is sad and some of it is empowering. And it's just a whole great – mix of things to to see some of those those perspectives when folks might not be willing to share that with you in person oh man all of that just described recovery of stroke survivors <laughs> <laughs> so you know i mean obviously the other uh important part of the way uh the way you you lived your life is is through your nerddom and geekery and enjoying all of those things that uh, key part of of your podcast title so when did you first really embrace your inner nerd oh man so i uh, i'm 41 years old so and so i was born in 1977 the same year that star wars came out so i've literally been a nerd since birth (laughs) (laughs) it's it's a beautiful age it's a beautiful time we live in because i i always say i'm a 90s kid i wasn't born in the 90s but i was like a kid i was a teenager in the 90s like the most impactful years of your life being a nerd was not the thing to be I was also an athlete. So like that got me by, but you know, Mm -hmm. like I, I love nerdy things. It's, and back then nerd was like, it was a bad word. It's a, it was a four letter word. Like, Oh, you nerd. Now it's like, Oh, you're a nerd. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. (laughs) Um, so, but, but being nerdy, I, I've been a nerd, I think my entire life. And now like my inner nerd is now outer nerd, which is such a beautiful thing. Yeah. It's awesome. You let that geek flag fly. Oh, with, with without question, you know, like it, it's it's just such a, a beautiful time where the biggest movies and the biggest actors and actresses in the world are all superheroes. I love this. <laughs> it makes me so happy. And the Star Trek universe is growing and we've got Doctor Who with a budget. And- oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. It doesn't look like it's a, a public access anymore. Oh, yeah, I know. I mean, I was watching the uh, one of the last seasons of, of Doctor Who, the Sylvester McCoy years, and looking at that production and realizing that was on the air at the same time the next generation was on in the U.S. And just the oh, huge difference God. between the thing. <laughs> that, you think about that it. That puts it into perspective, <laughs> for sure. The side-by-side of those two shows. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's so crazy. I didn't, I, I didn't even think of it that way. That's bizarre. <laughs> So how is being a nerd and embracing this, you know, sort of helped with your recovery? Man, I think it's helped because um, through nerdum is how I've kind of recovered a lot. I compare my recovery a lot through like certain characters in, in, in the cartoons and the comic books in the movies. And it's it's kind of like the hero's journey, you know, and you have like the every single superhero out there, every single good guy in these movies, they have those moments where they just get beaten down and it's like, okay, well, what do you do? Do you stay down? No, they're the hero. They have to keep on moving forward. They have to get up and they have to, you know, go keep moving forward no matter what. So every single time, like, you know, I'm struggling through recovery or I'm having one of those moments, one of those days, you just kind of like look back, either you watch one of the movies, you just, you're reminded of one of the shows and you're like, Hey, well, this happened to that guy and he didn't give up and he did this that's what i want to do it's 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 very motivating it's it's great Mm -hmm. to compare yourself almost like a superhero because to be honest i think all of us stroke survivors out there we are superheroes we really are absolutely uh one of the things i i used to think about when i was in the hospital and you're starting to experience and i'm starting to experience things like the tone and the spasticity as different functions of my body go offline to protect other things you know it, it felt like sort of uh you know in the enterprises in battle and diverting all power to the shields pulling away from less as- less essential functions in the moment uh to just take care of what's happening critically to resolve this immediate issue that's So awesome. I love that so much. You're speaking my language. This is beautiful. And, you know, and and the other experience, too, that I found was really interesting was that I I also was contending with a lot of the emotional lability or the pseudobulbar affect in the hospital where you just sort of start bursting out crying for no apparent reason. And, you know, it felt good. Uh, and so there were times where I would just, you know, channel the various doctors' departures into their regeneration at those moments to facilitate that, too. See, you get it 100 <laughs> percent. 
<laughs> yeah, that, that, that emotional uh, roller coaster is very, very strange, you know? It's almost like multiple personalities, you know? Mm-hmm. I feel like Two-Face a little bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I, I first encountered your podcast through, uh, through the Stromies, who were guests here uh, back in November. And you can check that out over at strokecast.com slash Stromies. Um, so, I mean, why did you decide to start your own podcast about your brain journey and your co-host's uh, own recovery with TBI? So it was out of necessity, actually. Um The first full year, about the first full year of my recovery was the most isolating, lonely time of my life. I couldn't find others like me. You know, Mm -hmm. I felt so, so broken and alone. Now, I have the the un just the unmatched, I guess, companionship and help of my significant other. Like she is she's just incredible. She has been there every step of the way and she has just been the most important piece of my recovery, but she can only understand so much, you know, unless you've been through it, you don't really understand. So like she, she was there, but I was still, I still felt something was missing. I still felt so alone, even though I had her there every step of the way chance meeting with my, my co-host um, at a party And I was talking and she was just staring at me. I was talking about my stroke. And when we talked afterwards, uh, she said, I understand everything that you're going through. I go through the same thing. I had a severe concussion from a car accident and we, we met for coffee a couple of times and it was so helpful in talking to her. And I found out she was a big nerd and I was like, Oh my God, we should do this more often. So we, we, every, we met, I maybe once or twice and we decided, you know, like this is great for our recovery. And I was like, you know what, if we do this for us, we can also do this for all the other people out there that don't have, you know, somebody that's standing in front of them. Like we can help so many people out there and help ourselves as well. So I decided to do the podcast and, and, and created the, the neuro nerds. Cause we were both, uh, both had neurological issues and we're both nerds. <laughs> so, uh, I decided to do the podcast out of necessity for myself and also out of the need to help, like just, you know, this as a stroke survivor, as a need to help other survivors out there, not go through what we've been through. And, you know, you two have, you know, you know, very different, very different people, but you have such fantastic chemistry on, on air. It's a great partnership. Oh, thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. I, I love Lauren. Lauren is so crazy, and I'm normally physically afraid of my co-host. <laughs> yeah, she's a renaissance woman. She does it all. I mean, she's a dance teacher. She's a um, an instructor. She's a black belt. She's, she, she's amazing. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. And, w- and what's been the biggest surprise to come out of the show? The biggest surprise for me is, well, it's, it's, there's a couple things. Um, how helpful and how beautiful our community is. Like mm. I, I knew how I felt like once I had the, 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 the help and the understanding uh, of Lauren and somebody that understood what I was going through that, like that got it. And even when I, I would say, you know, I'm having a day and I talked to her and she, she got it and vice versa and talking to these other people and Every single one of them, no matter where they are in recovery. Hey, how can I help? You know, how, how can I do more? How can I reach other people in the community? How can I grow this community? That was amazing. That I, I just I just love that. That was really surprising how helpful all of these people are. Um, and also what, what was actually like mind blowing for me is that I'm actually listened to in like over 40 countries now. <laughs> that was crazy to me because mm. I'm literally doing this for for not I don't want to sound selfish. Like, oh, I'm doing this for me. I'm doing this for my recovery and I want to help as many people as I can. And then, you know, a, a few months in, it it started to grow a little bit. I'm getting um messages from people in Belgium. I'm getting uh, uh messages from people in Australia, uh somebody in Macedonia. Like it's so crazy that there's this giant community that's worldwide. And the internet and podcasting is such a beautiful way to connect to all of these people. That that was really surprising. I it's it's a really really big world out there but it's it's all connected it's kind of like the marvel cinematic universe it's yeah. all connected. <laughs> one of the things that i think is that yeah you know especially interesting about this medium and one of the things i really love about it is that it is so much more intimate than a lot of other media out there because many of folks who are listening to the show are listening on their earbuds. They're listening. I mean, they've they've put your voice directly in their head. 
you can't just – there's nowhere else you can just walk up to strangers and start whispering into their ears without – ending up with another brain injury <laughs> yeah i wouldn't suggest anybody do that <laughs> that that is that's actually fascinating that that's such a great way to look at it you know it is very intimate you know like we're we're people are hearing us at home people are hearing us while, while they're going for a jog while they're driving to work you know like it, it's us and them like we're keeping people company that's that's it's such a it's such a great thing you know and it sounds like this focus ties into your uh, your your approach with your Brain Buddies initiative and the way you're connecting with other folks. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about uh, what you mean by your Brain Buddies and, and what you're doing with that? So there's I, – I fancy myself a pillar in the stroke community. <laughs> um, so there's a handful of us that have the same kind of um, mindset and the same heart that all we want to do is help. The, speaking of the Stromies, they're part of the Brain Buddies. So we, we have a, a, a call – um, like once a month where we have a, a documentary filmmaker from New York, uh, Kyle and the stroke of genius. And we have the Stromies from Nebraska, um, a comedian from New York, Mimi Hayes, a photographer from Arizona, a model from Arizona, a, a, an advocate from Rhode Island. And we all get on this call and we all talk about like how we can build our outreach. And we just call ourselves the brain buddies because the alliteration is amazing. Mm -hmm. And, that's branched off into because like we're all doing our things individually. We're kind of like the Avengers of the stroke <laughs> community where we just all come together for the bigger picture, how to reach the masses, how to be you know the best advocates for our community, how to help as many people as possible. And then I've kind of taken that and and run with it a little bit on my own because there's probably something wrong with me. The amount of time I spend reaching out to survivors, uh, which I recently <laughs> found out I was yelled at by my occupational therapist because she was like, on average, I'm spending about seven and a half hours a day reaching out to the community, uh -huh. <laughs> which is a problem, which means I don't really sleep a whole heck of a lot. And that's the one of the big issues. But what I try to do is the whole is put your own oxygen mask on first. Yeah. Yes. I, yes. Actually, that's the perfect description of, of what it is. I definitely have to take care of my own mental health first. But what I try to do is every single day reach out to a survivor. You know, it's, it's like cold calling. You know, I just mm -hmm. I, I look up survivors a lot, a lot on Instagram and I just introduce myself. I talk, um, ask to share stories, build community. Um, and I, I've done that for the past few months. And it's been very helpful, not only to me, but so many people out there and I it's like the brain buddy initiative because I want everybody to be connected because I understand firsthand how it is to feel alone to feel isolated to just go through your day-to-days and not feel like anybody understands anything that you're going through so I never want that so I want to be in contact with as many people as possible and then in turn connect those people with other people and build this community the right way and and in the real world, then, I mean, what's been your experience with the uh, Southern California survivor community? So it's it's really weird. Um, the Southern California survivor community. Mo mo is, most is, questions about Southern California start with it's really weird. It, it, I yeah. agree with that <laughs> wholeheartedly. <laughs> it, it's different. There aren't a lot of young survivors that I've actually connected with here. Actually, the, the survivors that I've met are visitors that are visiting. You know, I, I, mm. I've I've connected with two or three people. Um, we'll be meeting really, really soon in person, which I, it's always a pleasure and a joy to connect with another survivor in person. Um, but a lot of times it's like my brain buddies who are just in town. I'll drive out to like meet them somewhere. And but like here in Southern California, it's it's you know, like California is just a strange place. You know, how they call it Holly weird. It's Holly weird for sure. Yeah, I used to uh, spend a lot of time down there because I uh, I worked for a company based out of Irvine, California. So I live in oh, okay. Seattle, but I was down there every couple of months. So I got a little bit of a flavor of Orange County. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Orange County is its own beast, too. It's beautiful <laughs> down there, but just as weird. Uh, I, I, I guess the other thing we need to know is who's your favorite doctor? Oh, man. So there's there's uh, there's a million. There's a lot of doctors, actually. If I'm going to go like if I'm having like a really bad day and I'm like, you know what? I'm loving villains today. Doc Ock, Dr. Octopus <laughs> is hands down one of the greatest villains out there. Like he, he's a genius. He's empathetic. Like you're like, oh, you know, he, he's not all bad. I really like Doc Ock, but I think probably Dr. Strange for sure, because 
I do, I did, I still do, but I suffered majorly from uh, tremors in my right hand. There's a scene in the movie of Doctor Strange where he, because he has like the nerve damage in his hands, and he's writing his name over and over and over again, and it is just chaos. I remember seeing that, and I was in the theater, and I broke down in tears because I did that. I would just be at home just signing my name over and over and over and over again and it was just chaos so that spoke to me and i think that made dr strange my favorite character my favorite doctor Hmm. fascinating i think that's what's really important is i mean a lot of folks out there i think look at these these are just silly superhero movies but these movies really connect with us in important ways when you talk about you know the brain buddies like the avengers and then suddenly it's brain buddies assemble and you've got this team for this adventure when you can connect with dr strange from working through his own nerve damage when you talk about the hero's journey this this stuff that people think is just silly comic books this stuff matters and this stuff makes a difference it absolutely does and it sounds weird And if you think this sounds weird, you really need to maybe take a step back and look at the bigger picture. These movies, these stories, these tales, they change lives, you know, for the better, not for the worse. Don't look at the fact that it's a guy flying around. Look at the story, you know, look look at the journey. Look at where he came from. Look at the adversity. Look at how he persevered. Look at those things. That's what speaks to, I think, the community. That's what speaks to us nerds. You know, mm-hmm. it's not the fact that, oh, well, the guy can shoot lasers from his eyes. No, it has nothing to do with that. Actually, that's kind of cool. But still, <laughs> um, it's it's the it's the, the, the <laughs> story. Even, even themselves. in that case with Cyclops, it's a disability often. It, it absolutely is. Yeah, he actually has to control that. You know, and I, I and and that's that's what's really interesting too is, you know, and you get past the stories, but a lot of these things they're dealing with are are you know disabilities in many in many cases that they have to contend with. When we look, especially at the X Men, we see that with the story of Cyclops, we see that with Rogue, uh, we see that with these other characters who their um, their their power, their super, secret power, is also their liability and in 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 many cases it's a way of looking at now how can we turn our liabilities our disabilities into our superpowers oh a- absolutely you know and and the, even w- w- with the x-men in particular so there's a lot of people where where there's a lot of invisible disabilities out there there's so many and those are kind of like like the x-men and then there are the visible disabilities where they're kind of like the morlocks i don't know if you know the huh. morlocks you know and they, they they go underground because like they're shunned by society and mm-hmm. look at the parallels of that and real life these aren't just kitty stories these are real stories um, that involve not real people, obviously, but like real people go through the same things. You know, that's why all this stuff speaks to us. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's why these stories endure and have for decades as they've uh, as these characters that, you know, we've been living with now for 50, 60, 70 years and more. Absolutely. So, you know, obviously you're the um you're, you know, nerd since birth coming out the same time as Star Wars. As we get to this point, what and and we've seen the the trailer drop recently. What do you think the last Ooh. Skywalker means? Oh, I am so excited! So, the last Star Wars movie, I just rewatched it and I enjoyed it a little bit more. I didn't hate it, but I didn't love <laughs> huh. it. Okay, was like, I just I just had some issues. Like I'm still a little bitter that I haven't seen anything more on the Knights of Ren. I, mm. I, I hope it's not rushed. I was really excited about that. And it just kind of disappeared. What I kind of feel is the Jedi Order is kind of coming to an end. It's kind of wrapping up. And they keep, like, dropping these little hints about, like, gray Jedis, you know? Like, maybe mixing a little bit of... Like, it's the yin and yang of, of life. You can't just be like this, you know? So I think there's going to be a new Jedi Order. This is just a, a, a Joe mm-hmm. theory. I, I hope there's something to it, though. So the, the new Jedi Order won't be Jedis. It'll be, like, a, a, a like a different branch of the Jedis called the Skywalkers. Mm-hmm. So I think he's going to be training Ray and several other future Skywalkers in the Jedi way. So I, I think the um, yeah the rise of, of of Skywalker is the rise of like the new Jedi. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I've been I've been thinking about this too, and I you know I like your idea a lot more. But I've been thinking one of the things that a lot of folks haven't talked about is uh, first of all. We did have that that kid at the very end of the last movie showing his. Oh, that was so cool! I love that. That was awesome. (laughs) 
But the other thing is that we think there are no more Skywalkers out there, but Kylo Ren is a Skywalker. Is he? His oh, mom. yeah. <laughs> I mean, his mother is Leia. His That's grandfather right. is, An- it was, is, is Anakin. He's a Skywalker. And maybe we haven't seen the Knights of Ren yet. Maybe that's going to turn into a direction of moderation. I don't know. Oh, I just know I'm really, really excited. <laughs> also, somehow, some way, we're going to get more Palpatine. Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and I hope it's not just in flashbacks. <laughs> it, can, it can't be. He's so evil. Like he, If I would describe his evil, he's deliciously evil. Oh, I love him. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. <laughs> that is a great way to put it. <laughs> so, so aside from the busy movie schedule over the over the next uh, over the course of the rest of this year, do you have any big plans for uh, Stroke Awareness Month? Now that we are kicking this off here, well, Stroke Awareness Month, I'm I'm excited. I'm excited, actually. So it's more. I was hoping to get it done this year. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to because it's been a little chaotic. Uh, so I'm shooting. For 2020, (laughs) Um, I'm I'm gonna be putting together a uh, like a a stroke run, a stroke awareness run, like a a a 5K um, for to to bring awareness and to help support um, stroke causes. Um, and, and I'll, I'll be doing that this year. I know I'm going to be working with the brain buddies and we're going to try to put something uh, um, special together. And also with the neuro nerds, we're going to start um, doing some video content. And we definitely have a few things um, set up for uh, stroke awareness month. Uh, one being, I don't know if you've heard unmasking brain injury. No, I haven't. So uh, unmasking brain injury is where you take uh, they, they'll send you this little mask. Right. And you basically paint it and draw on it um, and, and kind of describe what your brain injury is through that mask. It's beautiful. I think it's unmasking brain injury dot org. Um, but, yeah, it, it's it's a beautiful cause. It's a beautiful thing. And I already know even just thinking about me putting my um, thoughts and energy into the mask, like it's going to be an emotional thing. So my, myself and my co-host and a couple of uh, stroke survivors that I actually have in the area, we're going to actually do that on video. And I think we're going to release it um, on uh, stroke, stroke awareness month. So that that's we're going to be doing some video content like that and also some weird neuro nerd stuff that we've been wanting to do for a while. <laughs> I'm really excited about <laughs> Interesting. That that project actually reminds me of a project that uh, I don't know if you've encountered um, uh, Maggie Whittem. Oh, uh, I love Maggie. Maggie. Yeah. A- oh, my gosh. I saw the trailer for her movie. Mm-hmm. I was in tears. Like, I'm not an attractive crier at all. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, I couldn't help it. She's such a beautiful woman and she is such a warrior. And she is she, she's amazing. I love Maggie. Yeah, yeah, she is she she is a she is a delight and she's been doing a project around highlighting demonstrating chronic pain by modifying Barbie dolls. So she's been doing I a s- lot the, of this I saw stuff. the one where half of the Barbie had nails in it. Mm-hmm. It was just hammered in and that's like how she was Oh god, that's a lot <laughs> like unmasking Yeah, it's it's a very very similar thing. It's the visuals will actually show what like the emotion is. I, I think that's great. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to seeing her finished film uh, when that's when that's done. Oh, same here. So, yeah. Uh, So, Joe, if if folks want to know more about you and what you're up to, where should they go? Um, They can actually check out uh, um, if you want to know about my podcast, you can go to the neuronerds.com. Or if you want to find out about me, uh, I actually have a blog that t- I tell my story and I actually um, share other stories of fellow survivors at uh, um, josorocks.com. That's kind of my thing, josorocks. It's, it's been a thing for decades. It, it's <laughs> People are like, wait, I don't understand. I, 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 I'm, I'm a weird guy. <laughs> J-O-E-S-O-R-O-C-K-S. And then I have And most um, importantly, a section- you were able to get the URL. Absolutely. Actually, I, I'm, I, it's so strange and weird that it was there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, if you go to josorocks.com slash usorock, those are a, it's a whole beautiful community of fellow survivors telling their stories. And there's so many unique, inspiring, beautiful stories out there, you know, and I have my story up there. If you guys want to know a little bit more about uh, myself and and uh, if you want to follow the, the neuro nerds, we're the um, at the neuro nerds dot com or every podcast out there. And uh, it, also just reach out to me at Joe Rocks everywhere. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, MySpace. Is that a thing? Is that still a thing? <laughs> <laughs> every now and then I try to log back in. 
<laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm just going to go all the way back. A friendster? <laughs> <laughs> can they, re- can they reach myself. out to you via your CompuServe ID? <laughs> <laughs> Hit me up on my mobile two-way pager. <laughs> Awesome. And we'll also have all of those links over at strokecast.com slash neuronerds. So, Joe, uh, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us this week. It, it really has been. But like, I, thank you again for, for having me and allowing me to, to share my story and have this conversation with you. I think conversations like this are so important. They're so helpful to me selfishly. <laughs> but <laughs> for the people out there, you know, who aren't having this conversation direct, um, it's so helpful for them, too. You guys are not alone ever. You're never alone. And that brings us to our hack of the week. I do suffer from um, overstimulation and I get overwhelmed very quickly. I have a gnarly piece of, case of PTSD since the stroke. What's helpful for overstimulation is headphones. I actually have them in right now. That's what I'm talking through. But I have just um, these headphones. I have them on basically 24 hours a day. It's not to listen to music. It's to block out background noise. So if you put them in, basically you can hear what's around you. But it'll just bring the volume down of everything else in the background, planes, car horns, dogs barking, whatever it is. It's all of those things that kind of set me off. And I I just feel like I feel like a basket case. So it brings down the noise. It's been hands down the most important thing in um, keeping my my mental um, straight. It's also very helpful, too, because it prevents a lot of people from coming up to you and talking to you if you don't want to, because they think you're on the phone. And another um, a benefit to that is you can pop in a meditation app or like a, a like a two, three minute meditation or whatever it is. Whenever you're feeling crazy, overwhelmed, just take a breath, take a step back, listen to, you know, uh, um, meditate, be at one with yourself and move forward with the day. So any of these little things to help, you know, uh, bring down the stimulation uh, can prevent us from being overwhelmed. We, we need to put it into effect so we can, you know, use our bandwidth with like where it's needed also you know if, if you guys have issues with like lights i, ne- I don't necessarily have issues with lights but uh, if you do be arrogant be that sunglasses in the indoors guy or girl you know why not <laughs> don't worry about other people this is all about you i was thrilled to have joe on the show and celebrate nerdery and talk brain stuff with him one of the things i really like about this medium is that we aren't competitors joe and lauren have their show about stroke and brain injury and I, of course, have this one. And you know what? The more shows, the better. The greater awareness of stroke and the more opportunities to share our stories, the better. The more people we all can help. Hosts, listeners, the entire community. And the thing is, each show has its own flavor and personality. Just like everybody's stroke is different, everybody's stroke podcast is different. Joe's conversation with the Stromies was different than my conversation with the Stromies. And there's value in listening to as many stroke and other genre shows as you can. The Neuro Nerds is one of the regular shows that I listen to. And special thanks to Felice Lize, podcast engineer, caregiver, and partner to Joe, and Rockstar, who recorded Joe's side of the conversation for me. Seriously, it was probably one of the highest quality pieces of audio anyone has sent me. So check out FeliceLazay.com to learn more about her work and hear samples of her music. And head on over to StrokeCast.com slash NeuroNerds to find that hyperlink there, as I am certain I botched the pronunciation of her name, which will make it harder for you to spell. Uh, Sorry, Felice. Uh, So head on over to StrokeCast.com slash NeuroNerds to be sure to check out that link. Of course, another reminder that May is Stroke Awareness Month. So in order to recognize Stroke Awareness Month, what I encourage everyone to do is make sure that folks around you in your workplace, in your social groups, in your household, know the be fast signs, know the symptoms of a stroke that is happening. Be fast, of course, stands for balance, eyes, face, arms, speech, and time to call an ambulance. B for balance. If somebody's balance suddenly goes away, could be a sign of a stroke. E is for eyes, a sudden failure of vision, especially in the left or right side of the vision field or other sudden onset vision problems can, of course, also be a symptom of stroke. F is for facial droop. If half of somebody's face starts drooping, they could be having a stroke. A is for arms. Can you hold both arms straight out in front of you? 
Uh, if you can't and haven't yet had a stroke, you may be having one right now. S is for speech. A uh, sudden onset of slurred speech or difficulty uh, speaking and communicating and using language can be a sign of stroke. And T, of course, is for time. Time lost is brain loss. So when any of these symptoms start showing up, call an ambulance. Call 911 or your local emergency services number to get the ambulance there as quickly as possible. Fast support. Fast health care. Saves abilities and saves lives. So make sure everybody uh, around you knows what to look for with Be Fast. Go ahead and print out some Be Fast signs. You can find one over at uh, strokecast.com slash neuronerds. You can, of course, also find them just by doing a quick Google search. You may even be able to get some from your local hospital or uh, American Heart Association office as folks want to increase more awareness of stroke in May and really around the whole year. So head on over to strokecast.com slash neuronerds for links to Joe So Rocks, Joe's Facebook group, and a whole bunch of other links and resources and episodes that we talked about this week. Subscribe to Neuronerds and Strokecast for free in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. And are there any other stroke podcasts that you listen to? Let us know about them in the comments over at strokecast.com slash neuronerds. And of course... As always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you soon. The Stroke Cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Stroke Cast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network. Thank you.